Okay, uh, I want to welcome everybody to tonight's webinar. Uh, my name is Larry Cretion, and I'm the director here at Green Energy Consumers Alliance. Uh, I am joined by Anna Vandersbeck and Louie Hayes uh, for presentations tonight. Uh, the topic is uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which is a federal law, and how it affects uh, energy and climate. Next slide, please. So Green Energy Consumers Alliance I, is a nonprofit organization. I hope you've, uh, you're familiar with us. Uh, if not, we're a nonprofit organization that empowers consumers and communities to speed a just transition to a zero carbon world. Uh, our viewpoint is that uh, we are making a shift from fossil fuels to clean energy, but not fast enough. Uh, so we emphasize uh, the word speed. We also emphasize the word just. We want a just transition that uh, means that when we get to, as we make the transition to uh, clean energy, we make sure no one's left behind, that everyone benefits. Uh, we were founded in 1982, um, 41 years ago. Um, we serve Massachusetts and Rhode Island. We have offices in Boston and Providence. And we have a robust mix of programs that consumers can tap into. You can look at them at our website, greenenergyconsumers.org. And we advocate for better po public policy at the state level uh, at the state houses in both Massachusetts uh, and Rhode Island. Next slide. Um, so here are the takeaways I'd like you to uh, think about. The first is what we're gonna talk about. The Federal Inflation Reduction Act is a game changer. It sounds like a cliche, um, it might be an overused term, but it applies in this case. Uh, it's the largest investment in uh, the clean energy transition that the world has ever seen. Um, it's not enough, but it's going to help move us uh, much faster towards decarbonization. Um, we'll explain how you can combine the incentives that are in the Inflation Reduction Act with state incentives to bring down the cost of clean energy. The incentives, what's really great about them is they're available for at least 10 years, which means you can plan out how to get to zero carbon uh, for your home. Um, it's not something you have to do overnight. Uh, and so you can phase uh, in uh, some of the projects you might wanna do. And there are great opportunities uh, in your community where you live, uh, the cities and towns. Um, and so we recommend that uh, if you have any influence on city and town hall, uh, try to get them to do some planning, identify sites where they can uh, put clean energy projects into, the, in, into place, uh, find partners, find contractors. And uh, what's really uh, exciting for us is that there are tax credits in the Inflation Reduction Act. And then there's a provision that says that ta tax exempt organizations, nonprofits like ours or uh, a, uh, a community or um, religious affiliations can receive direct payment uh, equivalent to the tax credit. So it opens up uh, new opportunities for, for us. Next slide. Uh, when the bill was passed um, over a year ago, uh, this is an estimate by the Congressional Budget Office about what kind of investment it was going to uh, incentivize. And they thought that you know, it would be about $369 billion, of which um, much more than half was going to be affecting the electricity sector. Um, but as it turns out, um, that's just an estimate because a lot of it's about tax credits and they were sort of guessing how much uh, corporations and, uh, and residents were going to take advantage of the tax credits. Now, a lot of experts are saying it, that the investment could be uh, double or triple that num number. And that's why we're here tonight. We want to encourage people to take advantage of what's ahead. Next slide. Uh, go forward a couple. There you go. Um, here's a site, um, we're going to uh, email you out all these slides and you can find this on your own, but um, there's an organization that's been uh, calculating, mapping all the great investments that are happening in the country uh, in the areas of battery storage, clean electricity, clean vehicles, solar wind, uh, whether it's for manufacturing or whatever, even recycling of materials. Um, a lot of the benefits are going to go to people at home, to businesses that use energy, but also um, what's very impressive is there'll be a lot of money to encourage the domestic manufacture of clean energy, uh, whether it's batteries, or cars, 
uh, solar panels, wind turbines, and all that. So, um, and, and that's going to help drive down the cost of clean energy as we get um, improves the supply chain. Next slide. Uh, one thing we're very excited about, we'll be talking at length here about tax credits and whatnot, but there's also a greenhouse gas reduction fund that's going to be funded to $27 billion, which is obviously an incredible amount of money. It's going to establish really what's called a green bank to provide low cost financing for clean energy. Governor Healy did a good thing. Uh, she established a Massachusetts Community Climate Bank for affordable housing that will be a repository of uh, funds. The state put in $50 million, but that's going to help create a place where the federal government can pour some money in. Um, the uh, Within the $27 billion, there's $7 billion for a solar for all program that's targeted towards making sure that solar benefits low and moderate income people. Um, and we're very pleased we had a little bit of input into the proposal that the state of Massachusetts put in uh, for the maximum award of $250 million. Uh, the state has written its proposal, probably should hear about it within, say, three months. And hopefully the money will start flowing uh, to Massachusetts if we win. Uh, but that will be a game changer. The state of Rhode Island has also applied for a lot of money. Um, and we're, we're hopeful that both states will receive uh, funding from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund on that. Uh, but then there'll also be another $20 billion coming out for other programs to be determined. So equity is a big part of the Inflation Reduction Act throughout. Next slide. So I'm going to give you uh, some rundown of the federal residential clean energy credits. Um, again, they will be uh, going for it. 10 years, um, which is a lot better. Uh, the ta solar tax credit, for example, was set to expire, but now it's going on for 10 or more years. It applies to several technologies, solar PV, water heating, home battery storage with or without solar for the first time, you can now get a 30% tax credit with home battery storage um, and geothermal ground source heat pumps um, are, are eligible. Um, the amount will start at 30%, uh, actually in 2022, will run up to 30% to for through 2032. Uh, then it drops off uh, over the next uh, couple of years after that to 26 and 24%, which is still pretty good. But what's uh, also exciting is that uh, you can get an extra 10% if the project in, is in a certified low income community. That's a census tract where it's 80% of the uh, area median income. Um, and uh, you can get a tax credit of 20% uh, more uh, for a total of 50% if the economic benefits from the project flow to low income households. Um, so we're actually, uh, we'll talk more, but we think that this will mean a lot of solar for um, benefiting uh, low income communities and low income households. And that's in addition to that um, solar for all uh, program I mentioned. For more information, you can go to the IRS website uh, for that. Uh, we strongly recommend, if you're interested in the clean energy incentives, uh, go to rewiringamerica.org and look for their IRA calculator. You type in your zip code, your home, whether you own or rent, what your household income is, whether you're filing single or jointly, and how many people are in your house. Um, it's a great... Uh, source of information it's it's they won't have your name uh it's it's uh it's anonymous but uh that'll help they will use that to determine um whether or not you're in a house uh an area that is uh eligible for some of the enhanced um uh rebates and tax credits next slide uh and so what again what i'm excited to report is that uh a lot of nonprofit organizations that have tried to install solar, uh, they've had to sometimes partner with a, uh, a for-profit company because previously the tax credits were only available to um, uh, companies that had a tax liability. Um, and, and so what that usually meant was if a nonprofit or a city hall wanted to put solar panels on top, they'd have to lease the roof to a uh, a for-profit corporation and hopefully uh, get paid in some way by that corporation 
but the corporation would be taking the tax credit. Um, now, if if it's an, an option that's available to us as, as nonprofit organizations and communities is to uh, do a project, um, can still go with with a with a for profit corporation if if you wanted, but now we can get the equivalent of the direct pay. Essentially, what that means is the Treasury U.S. Treasury Department would send a check uh, to the uh, tax exempt organization. So we're we're excited about that. We're actually planning on doing some projects uh, that way at Green Energy Consumers Alliance. Now the states also have great solar incentives, both of them, Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Uh, they they both have a policy called net metering, which uh, when the solar is running, um, it essentially makes your meter go backwards to offset your own energy use. Uh, that's called behind the meter. Um, Massachusetts additionally has a different program. Instead of net metering, um, they uh, have a program called SMART, and um, that's where they you sign up, and for a period of years, you'll get a guaranteed amount per kilowatt hour paid to you by the utility. Um, the net metering benefit can fluctuate as the um, your electricity rate will fluctuate, and the SMART incentive does not fluctuate. Uh, in Massachusetts, you can also get a, a tax credit of up to $1,000 uh, for installing solar, 15% of the cost of the system. In Rhode Island, uh, similar, uh, instead of the SMART program, they call it Renewable Energy Growth. Um, and they have a, sorry, they also have a, a fund called the Renewable Energy Fund that will help with uh, small scale solar. Um, but then in addition, um, go to the next bullet, um, in Rhode Island, they have a renewable energy growth program uh, that cannot be combined with net metering. That's similar to the SMART program mentioned above. Uh, if you are interested in solar, we have had great success. Uh, we have a partner called Energy Sage. Um, you can access Energy Sage through our website at greenenergyconsumers.org backslash solar. Um, it's easy. You can register for free. What you do is you go in you put your name, your email address, and your address in. And within about two days, you'll get seven quotes from installers that have been pre-screened by Energy Sage. Um, they'll give you side-by-side -side quote comparison. Uh, they'll have solar advisors will help you make sense of the competing bids. And uh, you won't get any sales calls um, from those seven uh, bidders until you press a button that says you wanna hear from them. Um, and you're absolutely under no obligation to install. Um, you know, in uh, full disclosure, Energy Sage uh, gets uh, some a cut from the uh, project if it, it if it, if an installation does happen, and so do we at Green Energy Consumers Alliance. But we've sent hundreds of people through this program, and the customer satisfaction is very high. Uh, my own brother went through the program, um, and uh, the even with the revenue that goes to Energy Sage and Green Energy Consumers Alliance, uh, and the uh, Energy Sage platform is proven to cut costs by about 15% compared to what you would get uh, through the market otherwise. Uh, as I said, uh, Green Energy Consumers is working with uh, uh, some partners, uh, Palmer Capital, One Way Development and Resonant Energy were supported by the Mass Clean Energy Center um, and it's a program called uh, Equisol. And what we want to do is put uh, rooftop solar on the homes of low and moderate income people, uh, tenants as well as homeowners uh, in Boston and other cities around the Commonwealth and I think also Rhode Island um, at some point. Uh, and our goal is to do at least 100 homes um, this year. We need to sign them up. We need to apply to the federal government for the tax credits. And uh, we're, we're trying to do this. And we'll also have a community shared solar component to that. Um, so watch for some information about that. Next slide. I will turn it now over to uh, Loie Hayes, who is our resident expert on heating and energy efficiency. All right, thanks, Larry. <clears throat> yeah, it's exciting times. Uh, we have to change all of our heating systems uh, to uh, make them run on things that are not are not uh, killing the planet. Uh, so uh, we're we're jumping on that as as hard as we can. Um, so 
um, if you're thinking about uh, upgrades to your home, energy efficiency, your energy systems, um, know first that there is the federal energy efficiency uh, tax credit. Uh, that's 30% of your energy efficiency costs up to certain limits, uh, $2,000, for instance, for heat pumps or heat pump water heaters. Uh, $600 for electrical panels. You can see the other items, windows, doors, et cetera. Uh, it's capped at uh, $1,200 per year, uh, plus the $2,000 if you're installing a heat pump or a heat pump water heater. Um, if you're not doing that, it's going to be just the $1,200 per year. There is no rollover. So if you think, oh, I've spent you know $12,000 on a heat pump, so I should be able to take six years worth of tax credits. No, you can just take it in the first year. Um, but it is great that it is going for 10 years. So you can plan a different thing every year. Uh, this um, includes, you know, the electrical work, which is going to be expensive for a lot of people. <clears throat> uh, we have a link there to the IRS um, site on these uh, tax credits. And you may have heard about IRA rebates. Um, there are rebates coming, we think, in 2024. Um, and there is a site on the uh, Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources page where you can sign up for updates. I've signed up for that, and I find it very helpful. They send out uh, press releases from time to time with with new information about, uh, about the rebates. But we haven't yet seen um, a site like that for Rhode Island. <clears throat> And we haven't yet received a date about when they'll actually be taking um, applications for re rebates or exactly what they'll be offering rebates for. So stay tuned on the rebates, but yes, take advantage of the tax credits uh, starting this year. Uh, there are state incentives, uh, certainly both in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, the Mass Save program offer, uh, covers most communities in Massachusetts. If you live in a town with a municipal light plant, you should check their website instead. And of course, in Rhode Island, there's Rhode Island Energy and <clears throat> Energy Wise Rhode Island. Um, and now the Rhode Island Office of Energy Resources is offering additional funding for heat pumps. And we'll go into that in just a minute. Um, in Massachusetts, there's the whole home heat pump rebate. So this is if you're converting 100% of your heating needs to heat pumps, that rebate is $10,000. If you uh, have a moderate income household, uh, that, in, that rebate is increased to 16,000. And if you're a low income household, that in, it, it, um, subsidy is 100% um, if you're qualified by your local cap agency or the ABCD Statewide Client Services Center for a uh, heat pump conversion. <clears throat> now, for homes that want to retain an active fossil fuel system, that's what we call a partial. Um, it could be for a part of your house or it could be for the coldest weather <clears throat> that you would keep the fossil fuel back up to turn on at that time. Um, there is an incentive for that, but it's measured by ton of heating capacity. Uh, it's $1,250 uh, per ton. Um, the average house might use anywhere from, <coughs> say, uh, two tons to five tons, six tons, depending on how big the house is, whether you have cathedral ceilings, etc. cetera. Um, but um, for every ton of capacity that you provide by heat pump, you can get this uh, partial home incentive. There are also incentives for geothermal uh, heat pumps. Uh, these take the heat out of the ground and take the cooling out of the ground as opposed to out of the air. They're very efficient because the temperature under the ground stays um, around 50 degrees all year long, uh, and it's much easier to get heat out of 50 degrees than it is to get out of uh, out of the zero temperature air. Uh, the incentive is higher for geothermal heat pumps. It's uh, $15,000, uh, plus, of course, that 30% federal tax credit, which is um, <clears throat> uh, different from the, the $2,000 uh, for, for heat pumps. Um, and that's increased to $30,000 for uh, 
income eligible households. Uh, the, the incentive is greater because the cost of installation is greater. Um, in Rhode Island, the geothermal uh, incentive is just $1,250 per ton. And of course, that's in addition to the federal tax credit. And there are additional incentives for heat pump water heaters and, and just about every other energy efficient uh, appliance that you can imagine there. There are incentives if you choose the most efficient options. Now about the Rhode Island heat pump in incentive, um, Clean Heat Rhode Island is the campaign that was uh, launched on September 1st. And that one of the really great uh, consumer services that it offers is this free consultation with heat pump experts who are not trying to sell you any equipment, but in fact are trying to educate you about your home, about the potential technologies, and potentially reviewing, uh, most likely reviewing quotes that you've received and giving you feedback on those different quotes so that you can make a really informed um, choice. Uh, this is, uh, Rhode Island chose to allocate $25 million in federal funding for this program. Uh, the incentive is uh, $1,350 per ton, but that's depending on what fuel is displaced. Um, for some fuels, it's less than that. There is extra money for electric service upgrades, so that's wonderful. And again, if you're in a low-income household, your subsidy can be up to 100%. Uh, they're not offering that for homes that are currently heated with gas heat um, because the uh, cost effectiveness of that conversion is just more tentative and they don't wanna put anybody at risk of uh, having higher energy bills rather than lower if they're in a low-income household. And there's the website uh, for more information. <clears throat> Uh, Green Energy Consumers does run a heat pump program. It's to uh, advise uh, consumers, to educate consumers, to help consumers find trusted vendors and sound advice uh, when they're when they're actually doing heat pump shopping. Um, we have an online portal where you can find a list of trusted heat pump installers for free. This is installers in Eastern Massachusetts only. Unfortunately, we couldn't find installers beyond that uh, area. But we're happy to refer you to those people and to make personal introductions um, so that you can get uh, prompt service from them. Um, through our service, through our website also, you can get a 50% discount on an independent quote comparison, uh, which is a really valuable tool, um, a three-page report, uh, extremely readable and uh, substantive. Uh, it does cost $75. Uh, we think that's more than worth it. Um, you can also uh, book an expert consultation for your home uh, for only $150. Again, really valuable tool um, to be able to talk with an expert who is not trying to sell you anything. Um, so this is really useful. And you can find more details on our websites, on our website. <clears throat> and now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Anna, for transportation. Thanks, Chloe. Let's go. <laughs> so uh, the, the main thing that most people think of when they think of the IRA and transportation is the clean vehicle credit. This is the federal tax credit for the purchase of an electric vehicle. And if the last time you were thinking about getting an electric car was before the IRA, there's lots of new um, changes to the federal tax credit. So that's what we'll be going through today. So the first thing you should know is that the federal tax credit amount is up to $7,500. The amount differs per vehicle and how much you can claim depends on your personal tax liability. So if you purchase a vehicle that qualifies for the full federal tax credit, but your personal tax liability is not $7,500, the IRS won't write you a check for the difference. But we'll get into that in a little bit more detail in a couple of slides. Like the other tax credits we've talked about, this one is valid through 2032, which means you can plan out your purchase. Um, but the first new thing to know about is that there are now income requirements. In order to qualify for the federal tax credit, your income needs to be under these limits. So if you file jointly, that's $300,000. If you're the head of household, it's $225,000. And if you're an individual filer, that's $150,000. And this federal tax credit is available for battery electric vehicles, so BEVs, um, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, which are known as PHEVs, and fuel cell electric vehicles as well. But in all of those categories, there are now new vehicle requirements, which we'll go over on the next slide. 
So the new vehicle requirements basically fall into three categories. The first is that in order to qualify, the vehicle has to be assembled in North America. And there's a tool available that you can click on when we send you these slides to type in uh, any particular vehicle's identification number, and then you can figure out where it is assembled. Um, but any vehicle that is not assembled in the US, Canada, or Mexico does not qualify for the federal tax credit. The second requirement is a price requirement. So in order to qualify for the tax credit, a vehicle has to be under one of these two um, MSRP price caps. So this is the manufacturer's suggested retail price. For SUVs, vans, and pickup trucks, that limit is $80,000. And for sedans and hatchbacks, it's $55,000. One thing I wanna make clear, um, particularly because of the way that the car market looks right now, is if you purchase a vehicle that uh, the MSRP is $54,000, but with the packages that you choose and taxes and titles and registration and all that, it comes over $55,000, that doesn't matter. It's the MSRP that you need to look at. And we have a list on our website to help you figure that out. The third um, requirement is the complicated one. So the IRA creates two sets of requirements for the batteries, one about where the battery components are assembled and one about where the minerals that go into the battery manufacturing process, where those come from. And every year there's a requirement that a certain percentage of those components come from the United States or one of our allied countries. And that percentage goes up every year. So manufacturers have to prove to the IRS and the treasury that they're meeting these requirements. If they um, are assembled in North America and meet the price requirement and don't meet either battery requirement, then there is no federal tax credit. If they meet the assembly location requirement and the MSRP price cap and meet only one of the two battery requirements, then it's 3750. And if they're assembled in North America uh, are under the relevant price cap and meet both the mineral and the battery component requirements, the full amount is $7,500. I'm going over all of this just so you understand the background, but don't worry, you do not need to memorize this. There are handy tools that will just tell you what any particular model qualifies for, but this is the background from the IRA. There is, however, one way to get around some of these complications. So when you as an individual purchase an electric vehicle, the requirements we went through on the last slide are the ones that are relevant. If you lease, the situation is a little bit different because the Inflation Reduction Act, in addition to creating a residential or a personal vehicle tax credit, creates a commercial vehicle tax credit. So if you are a commercial entity um, and you purchase a vehicle for your fleet, you can take advantage of a commercial vehicle tax credit that does not have the same complicated requirements as the personal vehicle tax credit. And what that means is that a lot of the basically banks, dealer banks that um, manufacturers work with when you lease a vehicle, those entities are claiming the commercial vehicle tax credit. And many, but not all, are passing that on to consumers in the form of lower lease payments. So you may see some vehicles being advertised with a $7,500 lease rebate. That is likely the federal tax credit uh, being passed on from the commercial entity to you, the customer. So long story short on this front, if you have your eye on a car that doesn't qualify for the federal tax credit, but you're really determined to get that particular model, uh, take a look at leasing and you may see really competitive pricing there. Um, one thing that we're very excited about in the Inflation Reduction Act is that it creates a tax credit for used vehicles as well as new, because we know that a huge chunk of people never buy a new vehicle, um, but we also want to make sure that people who buy used vehicles can get into these EVs. Um, the first thing to know about the used EV tax credit is that the battery requirements do not apply, so you don't need to worry about tracking mineral or battery components from a vehicle that's a couple years old. Uh, next, the amount is $4,000 or 30% of the sales price, whichever is lower. There uh, is a requirement that you purchase the vehicle from a dealership, so you can't purchase um, from a friend or from somebody on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace or what have you. It has to be from a licensed dealer. Um, the vehicle itself must be at least two years old and cost less than $25,000. And then there 
oops, yep, yeah, sorry, it only applies at the first resale. And then the last point is that there are smaller income requirements. It's basically the income requirements for new vehicles cut in half. So for joint filers, it's $150,000 instead of $300,000. And for individuals, it's $75,000 instead of $150,000. If we move to the next slide, this is something that's very exciting and coming soon. The IRA said that in 2024, the federal tax credit should be available at the point of sale, meaning that a consumer, when you walk into a dealership, can choose to transfer the tax credit to the dealership so that you get that cost reduction right off the bat. Um, because lots of people can't afford to spend $7,500 when they purchase a car and then wait up to a year basically to get that money reimbursed. We're really excited to see this provision. It's going to kick in at some point in 2024. There is a, an application portal open for car dealerships to sign up to make this um, available at their dealers. So the details on all of this in terms of what dealers you'll be able to do this at in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, that's all still TBD. But the key point of this, besides the fact that you'll be able to capture the value of this tax credit faster is that it reduces or it eliminates that issue of if your personal tax liability isn't high enough of you not being able to get the federal tax credit because if you transfer the tax credit to the dealership your tax liability is basically irrelevant as long as your income is still under the limits and the vehicle otherwise qualifies you can get the federal tax credit so this is really exciting we're definitely going to keep our eyes on this next year and we will have a webinar once we know how that's gonna actually roll out, but that's a very exciting part of the IRA. Um, we have a whole webinar about incentives for electric vehicles, both for individuals and for commercial entities. So we're not gonna cover all of that here, but I just wanted to make a quick reminder that if you are in Massachusetts or Rhode Island, there are incentives that you can stack on top of that federal tax credit. So in Massachusetts, we've got the more EV rebate, which is $3,500 for eligible vehicles, more EV truck, which offers a higher amount for um, basically electric pickup trucks, and then more EV used for used vehicles and more EV plus, which is a higher rebate amount for low income drivers. Rhode Island's got a very similar program with slightly different amounts. Um, Drive EV is sort of the standard version and it's available for new and used electric vehicles. And then Drive EV Plus is this higher rebate amount for uh, low income drivers. So in both of those cases, you can stack those incentives on top of each other to really bring down the price um, of an electric vehicle. We'll send out these slides. We've got a link to our incentives page where you can learn all about that. Um, and I think I'm ready for the next slide. So we have a uh, tool on our website that you can visit if you go to greenenergyconsumers.org slash drivegreen. There's a big friendly button that says find cars. And when you click on that, you'll come to this tool where we have all the latest information and the key information about the different vehicles that are actually available on the market. So for each one, we'll list some of the fast facts. So we'll tell you what the range is, how many seats there are, um, what kind of charging capabilities the vehicle has. And then on the right, we'll show you what is the base MSRP, what is the federal tax credit, and what is the state rebate. And then we'll do the math for you and show you, okay, if you start with the base MSRP and subtract those two incentives, you can uh, expect to pay about this much. So you can use this tool to sort and filter by different characteristics. Um, so if you're looking for a vehicle that has at least 200 miles of range and is all electric and has seven seats, we'll show you what the options are. And this means you've really got a one-stop shopping kind of place to figure out what vehicles you might be in the market for. So you don't have to go out and figure out what, what percentage of the minerals in the battery come from uh, countries where the U.S. has a free trade agreement. So this link is on our website. We'll share it in the slides as well, but our hope is that uh, it'll make the car shopping process a lot easier by just showing you everything in one place. Um, we've talked mostly about electric vehicles, but of course you need to charge those vehicles somewhere. Um, and the IRA, in addition to the tax credit for vehicles, institutes a tax credit for installing charging stations. This is both for commercial and residential. Today we're talking about residential. Uh, the amount is 30% of the cost of installing a charging station at home, not to exceed $1,000. Uh, 
but it's only available in certain census tracts. So in order to qualify, the property has to be in a census tract that is either qualified as low income or non-urban, AKA rural. Um, we've made a little how-to guide of how to figure out if uh, your property is in one of those two categories. We're link linking to it here, but it's also on our website, but you can use that to figure out um, if this is an incentive that you can take advantage of. If you live in Massachusetts, there are lots of other incentives from mostly the electric utilities, National Grid, Eversource, and Unitil. Um, and we've got all of that information on our website, but there's pretty uh, significant incentives there depending on what kind of building you live in and where it is for both the infrastructure upgrades and the actual hardware of the charging station. So um, definitely check that out on our website. And if you live in a multi-unit dwelling that has five or more units uh, in Massachusetts, there's a special rebate program from the state called Mass EVIP that can help cover the costs of installing charging there as well. Um, for any Rhode Islanders on the call right now, there aren't any incentives uh, to install charging, but we're hoping that Rhode Island Energy will propose uh, some soon. Uh, moving right along, I just want to highlight that there's so much more to the IRA than just the tax credit on the transportation front. Um, the production tax credit, which for a long time has helped spur the growth of the wind industry in the U.S., is now extended to battery manufacturing. And we've already seen a bunch of manufacturers uh, uh, declare that they're going to build new plants in, in the battery belt and other places in the country. The EV tax credit itself is structured in a way to incentivize manufacturers to build batteries that use um, components or, or minerals that were recycled from previous batteries. Um, so you're seeing a lot of news about um, different company is working to make a closed loop cycle of making sure old EV batteries get reused into new EV batteries or uh, recycled into new EV batteries. Um, if we go to the next couple of bullets, Loey, there's also a lot of direct funding. So there's billions of dollars in terms of loans to new clean vehicle manufacturing plants or just straight out grants to revamp existing auto plants into ones that produce electric vehicles. And if you go back to the tool that Larry showed at the very beginning, you can filter by clean vehicle and you can see some of those projects. There's news about this all the time of new um, plants being announced across the country. And then uh, there's also money for zero emissions equipment at ports because it's not just uh, vehicles and trucks, but also forklifts and all sorts of things that pollute uh, pollute the air, not just in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, but also in terms of the type of pollution that harms human health. So there's a ton in the IRA, all of which is, is working and in, in changing the market right now. Um, so one thing that I know people are particularly interested in with electric vehicles is this issue of the batteries and manufacturing. Um, and this is a map from the International Council on Clean Transportation that shows within the US um, different types of battery plants, either ones that um, recycle lithium ion batteries um, or ones that build lithium ion batteries. And this is a great um, resource. You can click on the link when we send it, but you can see that there's a lot of growth happening in this space. And when we go to the next slide, um, I'll talk a little bit about how what this looks like in the big picture. So. Um, this is a graph that shows you the amount of investment in electric vehicles um, since 2015. And you can see that we took a big jump with the bipartisan infrastructure law, which we're not even talking about today, and then an even bigger jump with the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, all of this means there's new models coming, there's new models coming that are going to be manufactured in the United States. And this is the kind of sort of uh, investment where we might not see it right now, but in a year or two, it'll be really clear. And then I think I only have one more slide and then we can turn to some questions. Um, coming back to that question of recycling, um, two slides ago, we had a, a map of all the different recycling plants in the US and it, it it's a lot and it's more coming, but it might not look like enough. But the International Council on Clean Transportation did a really thorough analysis of this and found okay, based on how many electric vehicle batteries are actually being retired right now, do we have the capacity to actually recycle those batteries? And what they found is that the installed and announced uh, recycling 
capacity that we have um, as of September when they did this analysis will carry us through the next couple of years for sure because a lot of the electric vehicles that are on the market are new enough that their batteries are nowhere near being ready to retire, which means we have some time to build up that market uh, to really make sure that once we start retiring vehicles en masse, um, that the capacity is there. So definitely doesn't mean we shouldn't keep pushing on this um, piece, but it does mean some good stuff is, is happening so we can get prepared for this transition. And I think that's my last slide, unless I've forgotten one. Larry, back to you. Thank you, Anna and Loey. Um, so now we're going to get into the questions. Before uh, we open it up for questions, uh, I have to do my job. Um, we have a great staff, as you can tell, with Anna, Loey, and many others back at the offices. Uh, and so we, uh, as a nonprofit, are dependent upon contributions from foundations, government grants, and individuals. If you're able to um, to make a donation, please go to our website. Uh, in Give Now, um, and in what's really nice is in uh, from now through December 31st, uh, a generous donate uh, donor has is uh, going to match contributions up to fifteen thousand dollars. So if you were to contribute a hundred dollars tonight, um, they would match that, and so we we would earn two hundred dollars. And if you wanted to do a monthly donation of ten dollars a month. Uh, they would match that um, as well for at least the first year. And Anna has put the link um, to that uh, webpage into, into the chat. Um, so we'll start answering some questions. Um, uh, William asked, um, to what extent can someone uh, double or triple dip on the tax credits for solar, for heating, for the electrical panel and the electric vehicles? And uh, it's... Uh, you can do it all. Um, what's interesting, okay, the the solar you can get, it's 30% uh, or more um, for the next 10 years, regardless of whether or not you do uh, heat pumps or electrical panel work or electric vehicles. Same with the electric vehicles. If you want, can get the tax credit for that, uh, it's independent of what you would get from solar or heating. Um, one area where they are... Um, the, the tax credits for a heat pump or for a heat pump water heater, um, they're up to $2,000 per uh, year. And so um, those you, uh, you can double dip with the solar or the electric vehicles, um, but that's as far as it goes is the $2,000. Um, if you install, uh, if you have to upgrade your electrical panel to accommodate the heat pump or the heat pump water heater, you get $600 in the electrical panel. So that's a $2,600 uh, tax credit. If you were to do the electrical panel independently without the heat pump or the heat pump water heater, you would not get the $600. So um, to help clarify that, if you go to Rewiring America, uh, their calculator, they'll actually produce a long list of all the things that you can get and um, they'll show you essentially what your bank account is, if you want to think of it that way, um, that uh, that's the kind of money that Uncle Sam is holding in an account in your name, uh, if you want to draw upon that. Um, another question is, uh, how large a yard is necessary for ground uh, source heat pump and how much expensive is it to install? I would say... Um, we're not experts on ground source heat pumps yet. Uh, Lowy has been doing great work on air source heat pumps, um, whether they're ducted or ductless, uh, but we are now doing some research on um, ground source heat pumps. Um, I would say if you've got a good size yard relative to the size of your house, um, that's about as far as I can tell you. Um, and they are a bit more expensive to install the incentives at the federal level and the state level are pretty attractive though. And um, if you're gonna be in the property for a while, um, a ground source heat pump is a very efficient way to heat. So um, it might cost a bit upfront, but it's going to end up um, providing heating and cooling to you at a lower cost over time. So um, we are doing some research on uh, what contractors are good for ground source heat pumps. Um, our program, um, for heat pumps right now is is for the air source heat pumps. Um, Susan, I, was, go ahead. I'm going to jump in real quick on the previous question about double dipping. 
for the federal tax credit for electric vehicles, you are only allowed to take one every three years. Oh. Um, so that is a, 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 a minor but important detail that is, uh, they're, they're not trumpeting about, but it is in fact a rule about the federal tax credit for EVs. Well, you know, I know a fair amount of the tax credits, but if there's one person who knows more about the EV tax credits, it's Anna. So, um, but also actually I, I should, one more thing, um, I thought she was gonna catch me on. Um, the EV tax credit is uh, limited to your tax liability. So if, if you um, have a tax liability of $5,000 and you get a $7,500, uh, a car that is eligible for $7,500, the most you'll get as a tax credit is is five thousand dollars. So that would also apply to the the solar tax credit would come in into that as well. So so you'd have to look at your tax liability a little bit you know, and to sequence when you would get your solar panels and your electric car and and all that. Um, but you know I, I guess it would be remiss if we didn't mention the fact that if you're going to electrify your home with heat pumps and electric cars. And your home is good for solar, which is it's south facing or southwest facing. Uh, it's unshaded. The roof is relatively new. Then you're going to end up running um, uh, at a lower cost, your, your car and your home. Um, so you might want to go for that. Um, Loie, Susan has a question. What's the range of cost for a residential heat pump system? Um, it's it, it varies greatly depending on the size of the house and the, the heat load that's needed. Um, but you can think of it as a very small, simple install, maybe even just a partial install might be $6,000. And a McMansion might be $30,000. Um, generally, we say, um, a, a small system is going to be between, um, say, $6,000 and $10,000, and a whole home system uh, starts kind of at the $15,000 range and, on average, might get into the high 20s. Um, but as I said, there are, there are ones that are more expensive than that, too. Uh, thank you. Um this person saying that they're going to knock down an existing single story home, rebuild on the existing foundation, wants to be as eco-friendly with solar and heat pumps. Uh, is there a resource to consult with that will develop a whole house strategy for energy needs uh, and capturing all the rebates and incentives? I would say that uh, a good architect or engineer ought to be able to help you with that. Um, I... Uh, you you can we'd recommend that you go to what's called passive house construction, which is as uh, uh, making the envelope uh, as efficient as possible, and that will help you um, uh, heat your home and cool your home with the with the smallest possible heating system, heat pump system, that will save you some money there. Um, and then uh, you know you certainly want to orient it so that it's south facing, uh, so that you can benefit from the solar. Um, we have allies at an organization called Zero Carbon Mass. Uh, is that a good source, Loey, for finding an architect or an engineer? Do you know? I don't know, but I would recommend looking at the Mass Save website for what's called major renovations. It's new construction and major renovations. Um, and there's a whole um, uh, outline of how uh, you can... Uh, plan to take advantage of all the rebates that are available. Um, so they have they have a program for you. Okay, I'm going to put into the chat, folks, uh, Zero Carbon Massachusetts. Um, I think they have a website. Uh, I'm almost certain of that. Um, and um, I know that they are led by architects and engineers who are trying to promote all electric new construction. So I I would recommend you might want to look at that. There's probably some good resources on that, even if they don't list uh, contractors. Um, Can I jump in again one more time? No. You made me nervous about the three-year um, requirement, and I just went and double-checked. The, the You can only apply every three years is a requirement for the used vehicle federal tax credit, but not the new used 
new vehicle tax credit. It's very confusing. I'll clarify it in the follow-up email, but um, thank you for saying that because I double checked. Okay. Uh, then a uh, person asked, can we explain the difference between a heat pump and geothermal? And uh, so heat pumps are uh, come in two flavors, air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps. The ground source heat pump and the term geothermal is uh, pretty much synonymous. Um, and it, with a ground source heat pump or geothermal, um, they're taking the, uh, the heat that's in the ground that's uh, warmer in the winter than the air that we have. And so you're bringing it up. And in the summer, it's uh, the, the, uh, the, the ground is cooler than the ambient air. So there's benefits from pulling the, um, the, the temperature uh, up from the ground that way. The heat pump, um, uh, air source heat pumps run like a reverse air conditioner um, and uh, um, in the winter. And then, then they, they can also cool in the summer. Um, and so again, uh, just real quickly, Loie, can you, can you briefly go over the cost of, of the heat pump, air source heat pumps? Sure. We don't really have good figures on the geothermal, to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, a geothermal could be four times the cost of, of a heat pump, uh, depending on, you know, what, what kind of system it is. Um, the, the incentive is greater for the geothermal, <clears throat> 10,000 for the heat, for an air source heat pump, 15,000 for a ground source or, or geothermal system. They're both heat pumps. It's just a question of where you're, where you're drawing the, uh, the cost from, I mean, the, the energy from, yeah. And in terms of cost, yeah, we're, we're looking at, you know, you could think of a, an air source heat pump whole home system being say in the twenties, and a geothermal being in the 40s, but it really depends on uh, what your situation is, what the soil is like, what your property is like, what your house needs are. Um, so that could be a very fungible number. Yeah. Uh, Kenneth asks, are there plans for us to vet, uh, meaning scrutinize and approve uh, battery installers? Um, uh, well, we, we do indirectly. Uh, if you go to our Energy Sage uh, program, um, perhaps uh, Anna or Lowy could put that um, URL into the chat. Green Energy Consumers, um, look for our solar program. The, um, the best way to get uh, a home battery installer is through Energy Sage because more and more when people are getting solar, they're getting batteries. But that's the place to go um, to. If you, if you already have solar and you want battery added, or if you don't want solar and you want just the battery. And just remember, I, I, I would go through Energy Sage. They'll help you get competing bids from reputable uh, installers. They've already done that. They, they've reviewed them um, to, to our satisfaction. Uh, that's why we partner with them. Um, and then um, the... Uh, Susan says, uh, signed up for solar, uh, asked to pay despite the tax credit. I appreciate the tax credit very much, but paying for solar means I can't do heat pumps or electric vehicles. Any hope for those of us who don't have a lot of money? Um, well, I, I'll turn it over to both Loie and to um, uh, Anna. Uh, I would say with electric vehicles, we're expecting the price to come down over the next few years quite a bit. The technology is improving. Battery costs are coming down uh, very rapidly. The last several months have been good in that respect. Um, within a couple of years, we expect to see what's called cost parity between electric cars and gasoline-powered cars. But Anna can point to the fact that um, there are some very affordable EVs now, and then there are there's the used EV markets uh, improving. Do you want to go over that, Anna? I'll just, I'll briefly say that I showed a screenshot of our drive green shopping tool, which shows you the new vehicles, but we have an equivalent one for used vehicles where we've grouped um, previous model years of certain vehicles together based on if they had the same original electric range. 
So you can uh, go there and sort and filter and say, I want a vehicle that had at least 100 miles of range originally, and then we'll show you what sort of low and high price estimates are based on uh, the website Edmunds. Um, but sort of larger picture looking at your question, I think one of the, the key messages of the Inflation Reduction Act is that all of these tax credits are in place until 2032, which means you can pace out investments regardless of what your situation is, you can you can kind of look at, okay, if I want to get off fossil fuels, these are the things I need to do. And you can say, okay, for me, the the most the next immediate step is this, I'll do this. And then a couple of years later, I can do that. And you can kind of plan it out. Um, doing it all at once is definitely challenging, I, I think, for the best of us. And, and uh, I would say, specifically, um, heat pumps, and I think Loie will agree with me on this, are uh, more challenging than EVs, um, pretty much in every situation, I'd say. So I think depending on how recently your home's been insulated and things like that, I would look at an EV maybe as the next option, particularly because, uh, as Larry said, the prices are coming down and then sort of maybe lay the groundwork for, for heat pumps. But I'll let Loie speak to that too. Yeah, by getting solar, you certainly have taken the first <clears throat> step toward economizing on your uh, eventual conversion to um, heat pumps because solar will, uh, having your own solar will will lower the cost of your electricity, uh, which of course is, you know, what you're going to be powering. It's going to determine your operating cost. Um, you definitely want to take advantage of any insulation offers um, that that uh, you have from from the uh, Massave or uh, Rhode Island Energy um, programs. Um, <clears throat> do as much insulation as you possibly can. Look at other ways uh, that your home might be uh, leaking heat, um, uh, and that will make it more affordable to go to heat pumps eventually too. And and as Anna said. The credits are there for many years, and heat pump technology will continue to improve. So you may be able to um, convert for less uh, in three years than you can for now. Um, so uh, definitely uh, uh, plan ahead and uh, think about when are what's the natural life cycle of the various things. <clears throat> that I have to maintain your your water heater, your your car, uh, et cetera, and, and try to think about planning for replacement when those things are naturally going to need replacement. Yeah, to, to use my own home as an example, we have, uh, we went with an electric uh, clothes dryer. Um, and so uh, that's an advantage, you know, we've removed the gas appliance uh, for that. Um, and right now we're planning to have uh, a heat pump water heater. Um, uh, so we've uh, we've upgraded the panel. So now we can have the heat pump water heater without a problem. Um, and so we'll try to take that tax credit um, and consider the whole the heat pump for space heating at it uh, in another year. Uh, another thing we're looking at maybe for 2024 or 25 is um, an electric stove, an induction stove. So that gets to what Lowy's talking about. There are different ways you can um, convert your gas appliances or, or fossil fuel appliances to electricity over time. Um, next question. Um, for Anna, uh, Peter's been driving a 2018 Nissan Leaf for five years. Uh, noticing issues with the uh, fast charger availability in Rhode Island. Um, and uh, he thinks that the problems are giving people pause about charging in Rhode Island. And what are your thoughts on that? Um, we have heard this in so many different variations in, in Rhode Island and in Massachusetts. There's not enough chargers and too many of the chargers don't work when people pull up to charge. I will say that I am actually hopeful that we are reaching a turning point for a couple of reasons. Um, the biggest one being that the other major federal climate law that we didn't actually talk about today is the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law or the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IIJA. 
And one of the many things that that law did was set up the uh, National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program or NEVI program, which is allocating funding to all of the states to make sure that we have a DC fast charging network that is built out so that there's a charging station every 50 miles on major highways. And so Massachusetts and Rhode Island are both about to release a request for proposals to um, actually put those stations in the ground. And there are uh, several requirements associated with that federal funding that I think will result in a better experience for drivers. Um, so one is that every site has to have at least four uh, stations that are capable of charging at 150 kilowatts simultaneously. Um, so sometimes now when you when you stop somewhere, there's only one or two stations at these federally funded stations, there will always be four. Um, and there are uptime requirements associated with funding. So the stations have to be functional, I think it's 98% of the time um, under the rules of that funding. So hopefully in the next year or two, we'll see a lot more DC fast charging um, as a result of that federal funding. There's actually several phases of it. So we'll, we'll be seeing the impacts for a while. Um, and that coupled with the tax credit for installing charging and then utility programs in Massachusetts, they're in place now in Rhode Island, they're hopefully coming soon. All of that should mean that there's a lot more charging and a lot better charging in the coming years. But if you've been driving a LEAF since 2018, I'm sure you've seen uh, some of the issues that will hopefully get turned around with this, um, with these developments. Uh, I think there's one last question somebody asked. Um, uh, are heat pump um, washers and dryers included as incentives as well? Um, and as Lowy answered in the uh, in writing, but I just thought others would make want to make sure people heard it. Um, we don't know yet what the uh, the federal government's going to have rebates for washers and dryers coming out. Um, it'll probably be uh, limited by mostly by people's income. Um, uh, those programs, as Lowy said, we're waiting to hear more about the details of the federal and state programs. They're going to be administered by uh, the Massachusetts Office of Energy Resources and the Rhode Island Office of Energy Resources. So we just we just don't have that information yet. But already in existence in both states, uh, you can get rebates from MassSave if you're in Massachusetts or uh, from Rhode Island Energy if you live in Rhode Island uh, for appliances that are rated Energy Star. Uh, so we'd recommend you go to those pages and look to see what you can get for incentives for those. And uh, Kenneth from Attleboro is asking um, uh, what kind of resources are available uh, for uh, municipal related programs. Um, the uh, in I don't know if Attleboro is, uh, has achieved what's called green community status, but Massachusetts has a strong program called Green Communities, which is if, if the community uh, meets a few criteria, um, it becomes designated a green community. Uh, most cities and towns are green communities and they are uh, annually will receive a check from the state uh, to support green energy work. I would start by looking to see if Attleboro is uh, is one of those communities. Um, and I should know, but I can't remember if uh, Attleboro has municipal aggregation. Um, I think it does, um, but that would that's what we have seen. We've, we recently wrote a, a guidebook uh, on that, or a status report on municipal aggregation. So we would hope that um, uh, Attleboro it has municipal aggregation. Um, and then uh, what I would say is all these incentives that we've just talked about are uh, very ripe for planning at the municipal level to find the sites. Uh, there are incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act and also the, the bipartisan infrastructure law for things ranging from uh, solar farms, putting solar on rooftops, um, uh, geothermal, uh, battery storage, microgrids, um, uh, electric buses, uh, all kinds of electric vehicles um, of all sizes. And Anna is uh, actually working on a, an electric school bus project. Uh, trying to we're trying to reduce reduce the barriers to adoption. Um, but you know, there's also uh, the states also have incentives for electric 
trucks of various kinds. So uh, there's a lot there. Um, and uh, if you have any further questions, you can can uh, email us. At, um, on the screen right now is how you can reach uh, me or Loi or Anna. Um, and I think, uh, I think we're done with questions. And I hope everyone enjoyed this. Um, we will send you um, the slides and some links after this, um, probably in another day or two. Um, and uh, we'll see you at another time. We, we do have other events coming up. If you go to our Green Energy Consumers, look for our events page. Um, Anna and her team do a lot of webinars about electric vehicles. Uh, Loie does a lot of uh, webinars about heat pumps, um, essentially EV 101 and heat pump 101, where we tell you all about those things. And we have uh, webinars about um, uh, solar with Energy Sage, and we um, have a lot of webinars about uh, public policy. And say welcome to those of you who have made it. Uh, this is Ask a Solar Expert with Green Energy Consumers Alliance and Energy Sage. Uh, we are so happy to have Matt Schuler from Energy Sage here with us today, and I will be introducing him more later. First, I want to give you a quick overview of what we're doing together in this room. Um, so my name is Erin Taylor. I'm the Marketing and Communications Director, sometimes called the Marketing and Membership Director at Green Energy Consumers Alliance. The reason I have many jobs is because we are a nonprofit. <laughs> so... Um, we are a nonprofit organization, and uh, our mission is to harness our power as energy consumers to speed the transition to a low carbon future. But what that translates to in a webinar like this is that we enable people in communities to make green energy choices. We really work to bring together um, vendors, information that helps people go ahead and make a green energy choice in their home. So today we're particularly going to be talking about solar, but we also have programs that work with electric cars, heat pumps, uh, peak shaving and energy efficiency, green electricity. So uh, we will be happy to share more information about that. Uh, we have several webinars on different topics, always at greenenergyconsumers.org slash events. We were founded in 1982 and we've been doing this work ever since. Our work is pro-consumer and pro-environment in Massachusetts and Rhode Island primarily. Uh, that means that we do work to usher in a clean energy future that is also good for everyday energy consumers. So we don't just, we don't just look at technology, we look at cost, we look at practicality, we look at accessibility. Um, and we create programs to get information to people when a technology becomes um, both practical and climate friendly. So that's really important to us. But what we found over the years is that pro-consumer and pro-environment are really the same thing because they typically um, they they keep people healthy and um, but both are about human health and both are about. Um, saving money in a lot of cases. So we have programs, as I mentioned, for many green technologies, and we also do policy advocacy in Massachusetts and Rhode Island for uh, energy efficiency, renewable energy, climate justice. All right, Kate, you can go to the next slide. I am joined by my wonderful marketing coordinator, Kate Marcelino, as well. She's in the background, but she's going to be advancing these slides. So today's agenda, we're just going to quickly touch on your green electricity options because we know solar isn't going to happen for everybody at this time. Um, and then we're going to move into solar and just give you a quick mention of why we've got Energy Sage here with us in the room. We're going to do a quick poll on where you're at in your solar journey. And then we're going to have a presentation from uh, Matt. He's an Energy Sage solar advisor, which means his job is to give unbiased advice to uh, people about solar installations. So he has no interest in steering you toward one installer or another. 
but he does he is going to share with you more about energy sage and more about solar installations in general and then we're going to have up to 30 minutes for questions and answers so there's a Q&A button at the bottom and I really want you to consider using that um, you can use chat as well but it's not going to be as um, monitored as closely. Use Q&A, write your questions, but also look at what other people are asking. And if you want a question answered, you can go ahead and upvote it. So if you take a look at Q&A now, you, you can see different, different questions are already up there and they're open. I'm, you can see a way to thumbs up it. Um, actually, I'm not sure if that's enabled, so I'll pop in and enable that in a minute. Um, but that will be enabled so you can upvote. So we appreciate that. So I'll pop in and enable that in just a minute as soon as I hand it over to Matt. Uh, all right, so quickly, other green electric electricity options. If you want to support renewable energy coming onto our power grid, but you can't put solar on your roof, you can make the switch to green electricity through our green powered program. And um, that's, uh, we have that up on our website. But at the same time, hundreds of communities in Massachusetts and seven in Rhode Island are offering green electricity options of their own through a community choice electricity program. And yours might be one of those communities. So if you're interested in switching to greener electricity where all you do is sign up and nothing more, you can go to this website, info.greenenergyconsumers.org slash cleanelectric there you can switch to green powered, or you can see the twenty one, uh, commu the twenty eight communities that we work with in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, and see if they have a program. If your community is not there, that doesn't mean it doesn't have a program. You can just Google it, Google your community's name, and community choice electricity, and you might find something that you can switch to. Um, one other thing I want to mention is you probably will get a lot of offers from competitive suppliers just independently reaching out and asking you to switch your household to their electricity option because it's cheaper. Um, oftentimes when the, that marketing is done, it might be cheaper now, but it doesn't wind up typically being cheaper than either a community choice electricity program or even the utilities basic service over time. And this has actually been proven and investigated by the Massachusetts Attorney General. For this reason, we really don't recommend that you switch to a competitive supplier for your individual household. Community choice electricity programs do use competitive suppliers and we do recommend that because it's bulk purchasing so you actually get a better deal. But if you get someone coming to your door or in the mail, please buyer beware. Um, Oftentimes they'll also try to sell you on green electricity, but often that electricity is from sources outside New England that do not need financial support. Our green powered program is supporting local clean energy that actually needs financial support. So we know that when people go green, they want to actually help renewable energy, energy get built. And with these competitive suppliers, that's not always the case. So community choice electricity is great. Our green powered program is great, but please buyer beware on green, green competitive electricity suppliers. Lastly, we want you to know that both Massachusetts and Rhode Island have laws to usher in a greener grid for everyone over time. And that's policy advocacy work that we are constantly um, working on to make stronger and we have been one of the major players in making it stronger over the years. So Kate, if you wanna to advance to the next slide, uh, one way you can help support a greener grid for all is to donate to our mission. Uh, it, we, we put it toward our programs and our policy advocacy, and you can do that at greenenergyconsumers.org slash donate. All right, let's go. So solar shopping, I wanna introduce Energy Sage. Energy Sage is an online platform. It's a wonderful company that serves a national audience, but is based here in Boston, and that's really exciting. Um, it's a Massachusetts-based company. Uh, they offer an online platform that allows you to register, log in, and receive quotes anonymously from uh, installers that have been pre-vetted. So an installer can send a quote into the Energy Sage system for your home 
for your solar installation, but they can't call you and they can't email you unless you decide they can. So we really like that. We also like that the competitive pricing, um, the result of installers giving you these quotes in a behind the scenes competitive bid process is lower prices. Um, and they compare, Energy Saves compares the quotes side by side, apples to apples. So you don't take the guesswork out of which um, installer will do which thing for you at which price. And they have independent knowledgeable advisors like Matt, who you can turn to if you need help interpreting it or with any questions about solar. So today is really about introducing that, um, that platform and that solar advisor option by answering your big questions um, and some of the questions that we know are big questions. So next thing, Kate, if you wanna advance us, I'm gonna start a quick poll just to ask you, where are you in your solar journey? So it is an untitled poll, sorry about that. But what we're asking is, where are you in your solar journey? So we're gonna ask you to respond to this in the next 30 seconds or so. And then we'll see where everybody's at here. So I see the numbers are changing. So I'm gonna wait, wait a little longer. Again, you should see a poll on your screen if you haven't taken it yet. Please do so. I see 91% have taken it. So I'm gonna give five more seconds and then close it out. All right. So what I'm seeing is uh, a lot of you are in the research phase. Some of you are actually already registered for Energy Sage and um, might even be to the process of choosing an installer. And some of you already have solar. So um, maybe you're here because you're thinking about expanding your installation or doing another installation, or maybe you just installed it and you're trying to figure out how to take advantage of the tax credits and things like that. So it's great to see you're here. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing this and move on to the next slide. So I just wanna hit real quickly before we turn it over to Matt. I wanna to hit top questions from previous sessions. So in uh, we do, we've done this a few times and what often comes up is the roof. So I want to assure you, Matt is going to talk about your roof. Um, there are a few things to consider and we'll go over that. If you have your own very specific question, you're welcome to put it in the chat. Uh, we'll try to get to it. But at the same time, your very specific questions about your specific home might also be suited to setting up a call with an, an Energy Sage solar advisor, which again, you just have to register and then it's totally free. So we'll give you all that information so you can register. Um, and we'll try to answer some of these questions, especially if they'll help others. State programs. So there are programs in both Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Other, other states have programs as well um, in New England and across the country. So we're not gonna go in depth on them, but what we want to say here is we are gonna talk about the Inflation Reduction Act today, which is federal and affects everybody in the United States. But on top of that, your state might have further uh, incentives. So that's always worth looking into and a good solar installer like the ones in the Energy Age Sage system will walk you through everything you can get. So um, in Massachusetts, Massachusetts, for example, there's the SMART program, which uh, does two things for you. It buys uh, your net metering credits, which we will explain, and also buys your renewable energy certificates at the same time in one lump sum that comes to you as a credit on your electric bill. So that's really nice. And typically what it does is takes away your electric bill for the most part. And so that can help make the investment in solar easier. Most states have a form of net metering. Some don't, but a lot, a lot do. And Massachusetts and Rhode Island both have that. On top of that, there are other no interest loans, 
um, tax incentives in both Massachusetts and Rhode Island. So just encouraging you to keep that in mind. And then lastly, I'm gonna turn this one over to Matt because we get this one every time. Um, this question is always, if I live in a multifamily home and I, I wanna install solar, can I share it? Can I share it with my tenants or with my co-owners? Um, and the answer varies by state, but I'm gonna have Matt answer that now, and then we'll jump right into his presentation. So thanks, Fantastic. Matt. Thank you. Absolutely, thanks, CT. And this is, this is a great question. I, as a Massachusetts resident, and I'd say really a, a lot of places in New England, we're all aware of the classic triple-decker structure, a lot of multifamily homes, and more specifically multi multi-meter homes where the energy is split across a number of different meters on the property. So the way solar works fundamentally is the system is always going to be tied to one distinct main meter that then redirects back into your electric grid. Meaning that if you have a property with multiple independent meters, let's say, again, a multi-apartment structure, you cannot have one system that directly powers all three units within the home. Uh, you have to have a system design that is directed towards one meter. What you can do in a lot of places, and this is particularly common in Massachusetts, but I believe in Rhode Island as well, it is still supported, is through a process called virtual net metering. And, and net metering will go into a, a bit further in the presentation, but it's essentially the program wherein your utility company buys your excess solar power. With virtual net metering, you can essentially accumulate a big chunk of net metering credits through one meter and disperse them across different meters that you own on the on the property, uh, allowing you to essentially, even though you're not going solar for each individual meter at the home, share the financial benefits of solar among those independent meters and then share the energy generated by your system with the rest of your community. So it's not going to be available in every circumstance, but if you have one, and again, the New England specifically, it's more common than most areas of the country, you're likely going to be eligible for, for a virtual net metering program through one of your your major utilities if you have enough space to put in a system big enough to cover multiple units. Now we can transition over to uh, a bit of a discussion on Energy Sage. And I, I really appreciate uh, Green Energy Consumers Alliance here for bringing me in to discuss uh, discuss Energy Sage and the role that we play. We've, we've partnered with them for a long time. They're a, a fantastic partner of ours, obviously. Us being housed in New England, it's great to work with local New England partners to keep people interested in solar and, and clean energy options for their home. Uh, as a quick background on Energy Sage, we're a national uh, solar and clean energy marketplace that partners with installers across the country to help homeowners like ideally everyone here uh, get quotes for clean energy options at their home. We, we started with solar, but we have branched into other options as well, such as uh, community solar, heat pumps, we, and we're branching into stuff like EV charging as well. So ideally, our goal is to make full home electrification and, and clean energy resources as abundant, as affordable, and, and as accessible as possible. And, and a, a big way we do that is by working with uh, nonprofits such as such as Green Energy Consumers Alliance to kind of spread the good word, so to speak, help bring in more people towards uh, uh, really learning about all the benefits that clean energy has to offer. And, and again, ideally making the educational part of that process as well. Uh, very easy to access. Uh, so we can move move forward here. Uh, quick overview of kind of what we'll discuss today. A quick intro on myself, what the role uh, of the energy advisor is at Energy Sage. We'll talk through the technology behind solar, how that works, uh, and then talk a little bit more about sort of the role of Energy Sage as a marketplace and in, in, uh, in, in that in helping you make your decision. We'll, we'll go into community solar as an alternative for people who don't have a home that's very suitable for, so, for rooftop solar. Uh, and then, as ET said, we'll have plenty of time, ideally, for questions as well. And I know a number of people have already put their questions in. Uh, I'll try to tackle these as we go through, if they make sense for the specific part of the presentation we're going through. But we may save some for the end as well. If we don't get to your question, absolutely, we'll we'll be doing our best to follow up and answer them independently. And as ET said as well, some of them might make more sense for more of an extended discussion after the fact. We have a team of advisors such as myself dedicated to that part of the process to be able to help people who have a longer kind of required discussion to really figure out their needs. But uh, again, to kind of go into Energy Sage, so we were started in the early 2010s as an educational resource for homeowners looking to go solar. We, we Our goal has always been full home electrification, but we started with rooftop solar, uh, really to create an opportunity for uh, people to make better and smarter energy decisions through simplicity, transparency, and choice. And uh, the way we do that, again, through our marketplace structure is by creating an avenue for homeowners to get quotes from vetted contractors around them who you know are trustworthy, compare their information on an objective resource. So essentially get get the quotes without needing to be sold to. 
uh, and understand what you're getting as, as most people will only shop for something like solar once, maybe twice in, in their lives. So it's understandable. You might not know everything. Our goal is to make that information accessible and make you ideally understand you're getting a good deal in, through the process. So, you know, you're getting competitive bids from reputable teams and are able to get the information you need to make that decision as easy as possible. And, and so again, to introduce myself, my name is Matt Schuler. I'm, I'm a senior energy advisor on our energy advising team. My team is here as a resource for consumers shopping through our marketplace to ideally have an objective resource to be able to bounce questions off of, identify next steps, compare your options. And again, I ideally sort of be, be your guide throughout the process for assistance you need to identify your next steps and land on the best solution there for you. So before we go into, again, a bit of a more detailed description of the energy stage process, uh, let's talk about solar and, and sort of how solar ticks from a from a residential perspective. So there are essentially five core uh, five core pieces and five core components that make up a residential solar system. You have the photovoltaic panels, the inverters. So essentially, energy is generated in direct current from the solar panels, but your home uses alternating current. An inverter is there to essentially make that energy usable for your home by making it uh, trans transferring it from direct current to alternating current. You have the racking and mounting systems that actually attach everything to the home and roof or potentially to the ground if you have the space for it. Uh, you have the performance monitoring systems that'll be installed to actually help you track your production, track the output to the grid versus to the home. Uh, and then finally, the optional solar battery. Batteries are a bit of a separate process, but I'd say they've been getting progressively more popular over time uh, as the technology has improved, as the costs have come down. Uh, and as more and more areas along the grid are, are benefiting from people having on-site backup uh, to be able to make better use of your own your own power on site. Though, again, they are inherently optional. You don't need a battery to go solar. Um, next slide here, uh, we'll go a little bit more into how the system actually connects to your home into the grid. So energy is generated off the panels. It'll go through the inverter into your main electric panel and then either be rerouted into the home to cover your actual usage on site, or it'll be put out through the meter and back onto the grid. And now that section going back to the grid is really the key aspect of how solar works uh, financially with you and your electric company. Uh, if you think about when your home uses power, most homes are gonna use a pretty good amount of electricity during the off periods, during the night, during cloudy days, periods when your system will not actively be generating power on site. If you had a battery, you could store energy during the day and use it at night, but though because most homes don't have a battery, you are still going to rely on the grid. Now, what that means is that the grid is also benefiting from you generating power. You're able to send your energy back to the utility company and disperse it around your community for them to use in other, other higher demand areas during the day through a process called net metering. And, and the next slide is going to display this a bit more in depth. Through a process called net metering, you're essentially able to sell your energy back to the grid. You During the day, you'll generate a bunch of excess power, more power than your home requires to function, the utility company is going to take that power, use it around the grid, and essentially credit your account for the energy that you're sending back so that during the night, when you draw energy from the grid, you're essentially able to cover the difference and, and sort of make up that delta that you that you generated by, again, generating power during the off periods when you don't actually need to use it. So most areas of the country that have a viable solar market are going to have pretty decent net metering rates. New England is among the best. Most of the areas in New England give you close to, if not full retail value for the energy that you're generating, which essentially means you're able to come as close as possible to fully covering your electric bill with solar uh, and essentially doing a bill swap, fully covering your monthly electric bill for what would either become your new regular solar payment, or if you buy the system outright, essentially prepaying your electricity for the lifetime of the system, which is obviously, especially for people who are looking at other avenues of home electrification, again, heat pumps, electric vehicle, it's a great way to help make yourself more more grid independent and and save money through the process while while being greener as a whole. So again, general basics of solar: reduce and cover your electric bill, invest in the clean energy economy around your area, uh, receive overall a, a pretty decent payback over time, especially in areas like New England that have unfortunately very high utility rates. So you can essentially reduce your carbon footprint, help the environment as a whole, cut back on carbon emissions, and save yourself some money as, uh, as throughout the whole process, I'd say. For people with a good roof for it, you really are able to kind of get the best of both worlds there. And solar is a great starting point uh, if, if it is possible for you. Some frequently asked questions. Uh, ET touched on the roofing question, which is probably the most common one that we get is, is what is the impact on my roof here? 
And what can I really do to be able to limit the impact on my roof long-term? Do I need a new roof when I'm going solar? At the end of the day, solar systems are, they have a very long lifespan. Ideally, you're looking at, at it as a 20 to 25 plus year investment. And your roof should ideally be able to support the system for that period of time. So if you have a roof that has already seen a little bit of wear and tear, maybe your roof is a little north of 10 years old, it's probably worth having someone take a look at it, getting an idea of how much life is left in the roof. It's very common for people who are doing solar to look into replacing your roof uh, as an extension of that. So a lot of solar solar installers are also licensed roofers. They'd likely be able to help you with both ends of that project. You can tie in the warranties together uh, and just do the full project in one swing. If you don't necessarily want to redo the roof right now, but you do want the, like the idea of going solar soon, it is possible to remove and replace the system if you need to redo the roof down the road. It's not necessarily always recommended just because of the added cost, but it, it is an alternative if you're not comfortable with ex expediting the roof replacement as a result of that. Other than that, I would say most roofs that haven't seen a lot of wear and tear, especially roofs that are within a decade, are, are probably a good good fit for solar. Uh, and solar can actually help extend the lifespan of the roof by giving it an extra layer of protection from the elements that tend to damage roofs, those being snow, wind, hail, direct sunlight is probably the biggest of the group there. Uh, so being able to give it an extra kind of shield, so to speak, is is helpful. Um, sizing your system correctly, we assist with that as long as you have an idea of what your average electricity consumption looks like and will look like long term. The installers will be able to help ballpark a system that will ideally suit your needs as best as possible and and come as close as possible to really el fully eliminating that bill. Uh, the federal investment tax credit, we'll talk about this with the Inflation Reduction Act slides that are coming up in a little bit here. Uh, but the, the tax credit is beyond covering your bill, really the major financial incentive for going solar that's, that's available in, in, throughout the country. It's essentially a 30% credit on the total cost of the system. Uh, so as long as you have, as long as you pay federal income tax, uh, you are able to claim a pretty big cost reduction on the total system price. Lifespan of the system, we as kind of just discussed, equipment is largely going to be warranted for 25 years. That's kind of the industry standard now for panels and inverters. So it's built to last. It's not like a car where you have to change the oil every year if you still have a a, a, car, a car that needs it. Uh, Life lifespan, I'd say systems are gonna systems are built to last. They there really is not a whole lot that you should need to be expecting to tinker with. Long term maintenance requirements can come up, but they are few and far between, and your installer is there to assist with that. And lastly, and this is another pretty common one, should I wait for better technology? It's it's still a relatively new industry. I'd say there's a lot of improvements that have come over time, and I long term ideally will continue to come. I'd say from the solar perspective, at least, we have seen a bit of a plateau in stuff like equipment efficiency. It's possible they'll continue to improve, but the rates of improvement are marginal enough to the point where I'd say, if you're able to put in a system today that's able to cover your needs, you'll save more money long term by being able to offset the extra year or two's worth of electric bills compared to waiting for, for marginal efficiency improvements. Something like a battery is a bit of a separate discussion. Batteries, again, I'd say are it's fair if you don't need the battery today to hold off on that. But for solar specifically, I'd say it's now is as good a time as ever with the uh, incentives that are still available. Matt, um, there are a couple questions that I think we could address now uh, regarding roof and size. So I'm just going to fire a couple things at you. Great. So there's a couple questions about roof material. Somebody has a rubber roof. Um, someone else just asked... Um, is roof equal to asphalt shingles or the underlying wood supports? Um, you know, what just kind of a, do roof materials and, and what what exactly are we looking yeah. at when we're assessing a roof? So typically for basic re-roofing jobs, it's going to be the the overarching shingles. Uh, that would be, I'd say, be the simple replacement that a lot of people would need prior to doing the full re-roof. If it's more of a structural replacement, because the structural integrity of the roof itself is really starting to get damaged, that's, I'd say, going to be a bigger concern. The installer is going to need to confirm that before they install it. It can become a liability for them if they're working on a roof that, I'd say, needs more of a full replacement job. So that, rest assured, if you're not totally sure about the the health of your roof at this point, the installer will confirm that prior to proceeding with the install itself. As far as materials go, you can go solar on a pretty wide variety of roofing materials. There, there are some that are that are generally no-goes. Something like a slate roof is typically not going to be uh, viable for solar. Uh, cedar, cedar shake roofs, though uncommon, I'd say, are not great for solar. But variety of different shingle types are typically doable. Metal roofs are doable as long as they're standing seam. Uh, the rubber roof question, I, I did notice that early. 
uh, is doable with, with flat roofs like that. You're typically going to be looking at a weight and ballast system uh, as, as uh, that kind of minimizes the actual penetration that's needed since the roof is flat. You don't need to bolt the system in quite as much. Um, but flat roofs are something where I'd say traditional shingle roofs, um, pretty much every installer will be able to do those. Flat roofs, most installers still will. But when you start getting to more niche roofing types, it can sometimes limit the amount of installers who who will do the work. That is, again, something we'll be able to help you sort through. So as long as you're able to provide necessary roofing info when registering with Energy Sage, we pass that info on to our installer base and they will only quote if they know that they can actually support the project they're looking at. So what, and we'll go again in a bit into the Energy Sage process. We provide the installers with the aerial view of the roof and any information you're able to provide with the scope of the project to narrow those quotes in as much as possible. So uh, with as much info as they, as you can provide, they'll they'll quote accordingly. Great. And then um, there is also a question about how close to the edge of the roof can you put, uh, how close to the edge of the yeah. roof can you put the panels? It's a different that front is versus good. back. That can vary depending on your area. So different regions are going to have different zoning restrictions for solar. As an example, for Massachusetts residents, residents Massachusetts is stricter than most areas for kind of how much space you need from the edge of the roof. I believe for a lot of areas, it's a foot and a half on every side, uh, meaning that they get, that'll be taken into account again when developing proposals, but the installers will need those dimensions to confirm how many panels they can actually get away with in permitting uh, for the actual installment, as otherwise it, they require separations on the edge of the roof on all sides for, um, for fire codes. Got it. And lastly, there's uh, several questions sort of about um, well, my roof maybe already has solar and I don't have any more room, but I want to add EV charging. Um, and also like, what about, so what if I don't have any room left on my roof? And along with that, what about installing on other structures? Um, so other structures can be tricky. There are a lot of cases where people will put in something like a pergola or a carport to go solar. I think one of the questions was about a pole mounted garage, which it really depends on the structure. I would say if it's actually a, a, a permanent and supported structure for a lot of cases, it will be doable. But again, it, it, it's going to depend on kind of the underlying structure of the roof itself and whether there is actually uh, sections and, and places to actually mount and support the panels. So that's something that and with more information and, and even an on-site survey, most installers should be able to confirm. I mentioned earlier as well, something like a ground mount is, is also perfectly possible if you have the available ground space for it. So the main roof doesn't need to be the only supporting structure, but it's typically going to be the preferred one from a simplicity perspective if it is possible. For existing systems, you could look into potentially removing and replacing the existing system with more efficient equipment if you're out of space. Ideally, if that's not the end solution, you you want to get as close to the full lifespan of the equipment as possible without needing to replace it. Um, but something like adding EV charging, you can obviously do completely independent of solar. You don't necessarily need to expand the system. And and that's, I would say, another point we get a lot is, is people asking, well, if I can't fully cover my bill, is this even worth it? I would say with solar, whatever percentage of your total bill you're able to cover, that is another, that, that's extra energy you're able to support the community with reduce your carbon footprint and, and reduce your bill, even if it's not fully eliminating your bill. So there, there's no requirement you 100% cover your needs with solar. It is at the end of the day, always gonna be a supplementary resource because you will still have your, your main grid connect. Thanks, Matt. Let's keep going on your presentation. Perfect, yeah, great, great question so far as well. So yeah, to quickly touch on the Inflation Reduction Act and we won't spend too much time here, but this past, past last year, the core impact on this for solar was increasing the residential tax credit up back up to 30% where it was previously and extending it through 2034. So essentially this locked in the, the federal incentive and support for residential solar for, for a, 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 an extended period, certainly more time than uh, anyone who's actively looking right now needs to be able to claim it. Again, it's 30% for the total cost of the system, which is now also extended to backup batteries installed with, with the system or on their own. Uh, so for people interested in that home backup, that is also covered under the federal tax credit. There's also a bunch of new credits for stuff like electric vehicles and, and heat pumps. And we can move, we can move through this slide here. Um, community solar. So touching on community solar as an alternative, this is another, another technology that Energy Sage supports. 
not everyone's going to be able to go solar at, at their home. Solar is, is obviously something that requires a pretty specific setup in order to be able to support. Most homes can at least to some degree cover solar, but you might not be able to cover your full bill, or you just might not have a, a roof that's ready to go solar and, and you don't really have the opportunity for that. We have an alternative if you live in a supported state, which most of New England is. Community solar allows you to essentially buy those net metering credits we discussed from a local solar farm in exchange for essentially a percentage reduction of your electric bill. Net metering, again, is essentially using credits produced by solar to offset your bill. Solar farms are, in a lot of areas, mandated by the state in order to be able to cover a larger portion of the utility's um, uh, carbon footprint. So there are these, as you, I'm sure everyone has seen when you drive along the highway, fields with hundreds and, and sometimes thousands of solar panels that are just generating energy and, and putting it directly back to the grid. Those farms will essentially be able to sell you credits at a percentage reduced rate compared to your electric bill. So you can essentially pay to support clean energy growth in your community and receive a bill reduction as, as part of it. Uh, the average reduction for that is about a 10% reduction in your, in your uh, total electricity cost throughout the year. You you allow the electric or the community solar farm to essentially offset your bill. In a lot of the cases, they will then sort of cover your electricity costs for you, and you'll be paying them at a reduced rate. So we have a marketplace for community solar. We partner with solar farms again across the country in areas where community solar is viable to let you compare rates, actually see the location of the farm itself, and begin your sign up process directly through Energy Sage. Uh, all it takes is some general sign-up info, an estimate of your average electric bill, and then you can get connected with the solar farm to estimate your costs and and actually log in your your subscription savings through the bill itself. Uh, for people who are planning on moving soon, or for people who don't like the actual um, dedication that long-term solar might require, and again, if you're looking at a 25-plus year system, it is a bit of a long-term investment. Community solar, you can cancel at any time as long as you give them a cancellation window subscribe to clean energy in your area and again help fund local solar projects as a result um uh, so again it's i would say compared to solar which requires an upfront investment community solar is essentially just it's essentially just a bill swap trading out your direct utility bill for a new community solar bill over time um so again community solar providers the farms have an agreement with the utility they build the farms they generate power send it to the utility you pay the solar provider and then they in turn cover a, a large portion of your electric bill uh we don't we won't dip too much into the actual billing degrees this is to, as a quick oversight there are two different types of community solar billing either dual where you both pay your electric bill and your solar bill and your electric bill is going to be reduced according to the actual value of the solar credits Consolidated billing, again, the farm handles your utility bill through the utility for you, and you only pay your solar farm. This is going to vary depending on your area and depending on the developer that you're working with. So to round things out here, to kind of come back to the Energy Sage overview again, our, our goal is to be able to help people best educate themselves on the options that are available and find reputable companies to really complete your project. Uh, I believe moving on here, we have an overview of kind of what that process process looks like. I know a, a, most of the people who answered the poll at the beginning here said that you're in the research phase right now, which is great. That's, again, kind of, I would say, where most people who look into solar but don't end up doing it get get stuck is trying to get the info that you need to be comfortable and, and confident with the decision. We have thousands of content resources on our site to be able to help you begin the educational process, whether whether it's equipment reviews, overviews of utility programs, incentive programs, and basic guides on how to get started. That's That's really kind of where where we begin and where we help kind of bring people uh bring people onto the resource once you're ready to begin the sign up process through us only takes about 10 to 15 minutes you give us your address you give us your average electric bill and a copy of your bill if you're able uh we don't we don't again as et said release your personal contact info to the installer so you're you're able to handle your shopping process completely through our site if you're interested uh, then you receive quotes within typically one to three days once you've registered. Uh, we we send out the property to our network of installers. Any company who works in your area and is able to bid will review the info, size out a system for you, and actually give you a concrete proposal and quote so you can get an idea of the pricing and, and again, the, just the general value, equipment, and, and whether you're interested. You can take as much time as you need to review. This is where my my team comes in. So again, we we have a team of advisors here help here to help you review, compare your options, educate yourself, uh, and ideally get to the point where you're ready to select a contractor. And once you're ready to select, we connect you with them directly. You'll be moving forward to finalize a proposal, and that full process from selecting through install typically takes about three to four months. 
the install itself only takes about a day, so you shouldn't expect to need people on site uh, for a week on end to actually get the install done. Uh, but to get there, they have to they have to permit the process, actually source the equipment, and then get the final approval done through your utility. Uh, but again, we we ideally are here to help map out that process for you and make it as as simple and accessible as possible. I just want to jump in and, and say again, free, no obligation. You can go to Energy Sage's website and use all of their learning resources for free. You don't even have to register. Registration um, is free, and then there's no obligation. Energy Sage themselves is not a solar installer, but they will connect you with uh, solar installers who, again, won't have your contact information. They'll just have information about your home to give you quotes. There's never an obligation to move forward. There's never an obligation to go with an installer you found through Energy Sage. If you find someone else outside of that process that you want to use, um, you know, you can do that. So this is a really a wonderful tool to help you. Absolutely. And and I'll add on, if you've already received quotes and you're just looking for some other comparisons, that's another thing we can assist with. If you want another set of eyes on the quotes you've already gotten to help give you an idea of how they stack up to the Energy Sage bids you get, we get those conversations all the time. It, that's absolutely uh, a worthwhile conversation to have, if nothing else, for a sanity check or, or making sure that what you're getting is competitive. And if not, then we can, again, help you get connected with companies who might be more competitive or more affordable than ones you've already gotten. Um, and if at the end of the day, if you decide, hey, I've got all these quotes, but now is not the right time, you can put the search on hold. There, there's no requirement that you ever proceed. Uh, ideally, we'll help you figure out whether it makes sense for you. But if now it's not the right time, you, you can put your put your account on ice, so to speak. And if you'd want to re-engage at a later date, you can always come back around and get your quotes updated once you're ready. So Matt, um, this begs a question that comes up every time that I think would be good to cover now is how do you make money? How does Energy Sage Absolutely. make money? And I'll jump in and also say that um, when uh, Green Energy Consumers makes a referral to Energy Sage, and uh, the, like any of you re are referred by us, if you go through the process and decide to install with an installer that was recommended by Energy Sage, we do get a $250 kickback that we put toward our programming. So I wanted to also make that clear, but go on, Matt. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and this is a fantastic question. It's one it's one that we field all the time as well as kind of understanding where is where is our stake in the game, so to speak? How are we able to provide the resource that we do without charging customers anything? So, again, as a background on us, we a lot of our initial funding came through the Sunshine Initiative with the Department of Energy as a consumer protection resource. So as a resource built to making solar more accessible, more affordable and more transparent for homeowners, we've gotten a lot of federal funding to be able to keep that in place and provide the service that we do. So, again, though we are private, we, we've gotten a lot of public funding. As our marketplace is structured, installers who work through our network do pay a fee to use the service. So. Uh, being able to kind of help assist with an installer's operation perspective, we're able to cut down on their own costs from a marketing and and a consumer consumer connection perspective. Installers do pay for that. Among installers on our platform, we absolutely pay no favorites, play no favorites. So we again, the core goal of our marketplace is to make everything objective. So installers sort of pay to play, so to speak. But once they're on, we present all their information on an objective level, and again, try to eliminate the actual sales process from that pipeline. Help again, make it just strictly about the info and about the education on whether or not it's a correct decision rather than, again, kind of needing to jump through a lot of hoops to get there. Um, so uh, again, our, our income is split across a number of different avenues there. And then we also have a ton of partnerships uh, with, uh, again, nonprofits like the Green Energy Consumers Alliance and, and with utilities to be able to help kind of spread our outreach as, as best we can. All right. And I'll, I'll emphasize as a last point there, Every contractor who works through Energy Sage is thoroughly vetted. We are not an open marketplace. A contractor down the block from you can't come onto our website and, and just register an account with us to start submitting quotes. We thoroughly we thoroughly review every contractor before they work with us. It's typically about a three to five month onboarding process for a new company, wherein we look at the financial health of the company, how long have they been around, what does their customer service and satisfaction look like? Do they have a good history of customer service? Uh, are they eligible to work in your area and will they be able to long-term? So we look and make sure that they are both, you know, again, financially healthy, that we're confident they'll be able to provide good long-term service. And if we think that a company has poor business practices that we don't agree with, or that we think they won't be competitive and won't provide a fair deal for consumers on our site, there are plenty of companies we've said no to. There are plenty of companies we don't work with. 
we do our best to work with companies who we would feel comfortable working with ourselves. That's, I would say, a pretty key part of the the Energy Sage um, Energy Sage process on our end. And uh, as a quick snapshot here, if anyone here has already registered for Energy Sage, these pages probably look familiar. If you haven't, I know this is a, a lot of numbers here to present initially. Here's a, just a snapshot of what the actual quotes look like on our platform. Uh, so we try to show you the the deep financials of the bids. What is it going to cost you? What is the return for you over time versus your current electric bill? How long will it take for the system to pay for itself? Uh, and then we also, if you're able to delve deeper into the quotes, we give you a full overview of the equipment. We have spec sheets and, and, and pages to actually allow you to evaluate the equipment itself, uh, view the industry endorsements for each contractor. And then if you if and when you're ready, you can actually go into the contractor's profile pages with us directly, read some customer reviews and certifications, check out the additional services they offer. Uh, again, our goal, though it is, again, it's a lot of information up front, is to make sure that any information you feel like you need to be comfortable with the decision and get an idea of whether it's right for you, it, it'll be available here. And then when you're ready to go, we have ways for you to book meetings directly with the companies. You can send them a message on our platform and really kind of continue the discussion and communication there, however uh, you feel most comfortable. And last plug for for my great team again here. We have a we have a great team of energy advisors working internally on our end to be able to help provide service and support every step of the way there. So whether you need assistance registering evaluating information, identifying what you're looking for and helping really map out the ideal system and search for you all the way through making a final decision and actually supporting you once you're moving forward with a contractor through us directly, we are here to provide that service and we make it uh, very easily accessible for whenever you're ready to actually get a meeting in place to, to start talking, uh, talking specifics. So I, I know we have a number of questions we can look to get through. If you're looking to get started, you should see there's a QR code on the right side of the screen here. You can scan that to actually begin your registration process directly. This will make sure that you're linked to our referral system with Green Energy Consumers Alliance as well. That way we know you'll, you came from them and, and that you're, you're here as a, a representative uh, um, from, from GECA as well. Uh, and so again, the registration process, it's quick and easy. If you haven't done so already, again, I'd say absolutely a great way for you to get an idea of whether whether your house is viable for solar and whether this is the right decision for you. And if you register through this QR code or that link, greenenergyconsumers.org slash solar, you do uh, put in place the connection that allows us to get a $250 referral kickback if you decide to go solar through um, a, a vendor you find via Energy Sage. And uh, we appreciate that. So uh, just letting you know that that's how you make sure that happens. Perfect. So here we are at Q&A. We've got 11 minutes left and we've tackled, I think, a lot of, of questions that are common. So what I'm going to try to do is leave a few minutes, at least five for Matt to scan your questions and try to give high level answers as best he can. I want to remind you that for your specific scenario, you certainly can set up a time uh, with a solar advisor and really talk it through. We do recommend that and we'll follow up again with a reminder that how you do that. So um, first I wanna ask a couple questions that I think are, are common. So like people are asking a lot about pole or ground mounted situations and if the incentives still cover them and if Energy Sage installers would take those sort of installations on. Yeah, so absolutely, they are still covered. Any residential system that's being used to power or offset your home electricity usage and bill is going to be eligible under the federal tax credit, and um, in almost every case under the under the more state specific programs as well. As far as whether an installer will take them on, it's a little bit more situation to situation based. Something like a basic ground mounted system is still something most installers will be able to cover and service as long as you have the amount of available space for it. Something like a pole-mounted structure is a much more niche offering. It's something that I'd say most installers will not be able to do. Uh, but absolutely, you can feel free to register and get an idea of what's available out there. If we're not able to give you a quote through a contractor directly, we might have some educational resources for that uh, and, and potentially some connection to other resources. At the end of the day as well, for, for very niche services, sometimes the best people to reach out to are just going to be your utility. Uh, to see whether something is viable and supported in your area. And they sometimes have recommended connections as well. But for more basic stuff like ground mounted systems, it is something most companies are going to be able to do. 
And what about people who are planning for more electrification? So um, like we mentioned, someone installing EV charging, installing induction stoves, heat pumps. Um, and before Matt answers that, I will say that I did see a question about, are there incentives to upgrade my electric? to electrify. So when you're adding uh, systems that uh, may need uh, further electrification in your home, so just wires and, um, you know, updating your capacity, your electric capacity, that doesn't, you know, that's not the actual equipment, but the Inflation Reduction Act does in fact have incentives for that. So the Federal Inflation Reduction Act does. I'm not sure about the state off the top of my head, but the IRA does. And anyway, go ahead, Matt, on the um, electrification, like planning for solar yeah. panels. So ideally long term, and this is what I what I typically say to everyone who brings this question up because it's a great one. Again, the system is is essentially for most people, it's a lifetime installation. You're for the for the amount of time you'll be in the home, that system is going to be there. Likely it'll it'll probably outstay unless you're looking at a you know a thirty plus years in the home, which is certainly possible. You, you're, the system is probably going to be there longer than you will. Uh, you want to size for your long-term consumption. You want to get an idea of not only how much energy am I using today, but at least a good idea of is my usage going to increase down the road. So adding something like a heat pump or an electric vehicle that you can get a realistic gauge on usage for is worth factoring into your initial design and and oversizing the initial system so that when that new energy usage comes in, you're, you're already prepared for it. Your utility might give you some pushback if you're looking to oversize by like 200%. But for, for at least a more modest over, oversizing of the existing system, typically they will allow you to go a bit above your current usage, as long as it's not, again, kind of fully uh, fully doubling or tripling your, your energy consumption throughout the year. And, since and your installer are... will be able to assist with that. Yes, the installer is going to be a, a very good friend when they can answer all these questions. Um, and remember, you can have an installer out to, to assess your your home without having to go forward with it if you if you want to um so there's a lot of people here who actually have solar and are looking at redoing their solar so just a couple questions about uh a, a few questions in there like using existing wiring from the old system um are panels getting lighter because someone says that the the panels are for replacing the panels they would be too heavy and just curious if panels are technology is developing and they're lighter. Um, and then also, what if you have solar on your roof and it's fine, but the roof isn't fine and you need to redo the roof? What happens to the yeah. solar? So for, for existing systems, absolutely that you could find contractors who will remove the existing system while you're going through the process of replacing a new one or potentially remove and reinstall the system once the roof work is done. That's typically going to cost a couple hundred per panel. And in, in, in most cases, so it's it's something you can certainly look into, and a lot of a lot of installers who offer ongoing on operations and maintenance for existing systems can do something like that. For expanding an existing system and using kind of in, in, in existing infrastructure that's already in place, that should be more than serviceable. The installer is going to still need to bring in again, obviously, their own panels, their own inverters. Uh, but if there's already work done for them, I'm sure a lot of them won't say no to being able to make the process a little easier on their end. As far as what the impact is that's going to have on pricing, it probably won't be enormous. Most of the cost for solar is coming from the direct equipment they're bringing in, as well as just existing labor costs that go through the full install and permitting uh, and, and stuff like covering their warranty coverage long term. So I'd say it, it probably is not going to be a huge reduction in terms of the install cost. But if you already have solar, that's a that'll be a pretty good starting point to know that they'll be able to work with the home. Um, and uh, what was the last part of that that question? Well, there's a couple of existing wiring and lighter panels. I don't know which panel gonna... panel weight really has not changed all that much. Panels potentially have gotten larger, but typically the the panel weight and the actual impact on your roof is going to be based on the total amount of space the system takes up because the weight is spread out across the full system. So if you have a larger, if each individual panel is larger, that also means you're not putting in as many panels to get the job done. Uh, so I would say the weight dispersion really has not changed much. A couple questions about own versus lease. Own yeah, versus that's, leasing. That, that's a great question. Uh, for anyone, again, who's lived in their home for a while, I would expect a lot of people have probably gotten people coming by door to door knocking, asking if you're interested in leasing a solar system. They 
are not terribly common, certainly not as common as they used to be comparatively to owning, specifically because of the benefits to owning versus leasing. And so for most people, we typically recommend buying the system outright or financing the system as opposed to leasing. Uh, since if you finance the system, you're still able to claim the federal tax credit, the state tax credit, if there is one, production incentives. Whereas if you lease the system, for one, you might have an escalator cost and you're not going to be able to claim those incentives that you actually get for owning the system outright. And, and the last difficulty that can come with leases is that it can create problems from a home sale perspective where um, you would typically have to buy the lease out at an unfavorable rate in order to be able to sell the home. So generally, I'd say for the vast majority of homeowners, we do recommend purchasing or financing as opposed to a lease. Leases can be helpful, for example, for people who pay no federal income tax. So if you're retired, they can be they can be beneficial. If you're certainly if you're not planning to leave, that can sometimes get you the overall lowest possible monthly payment. But for a lot of people, I'd say owning the system is going to be better in the long run. Okay, we've got four minutes left. So Matt, I'm just going to let you have at it in the question section. Great. Yeah, we, we can try to run through as, as many as possible here. We will, I believe, be able to get an export of the questions we weren't able to get to today. So yeah. we'll, we'll do our best to follow up there and, yeah. and again, give you opportunities. Uh, Andrew had asked, uh, replacing your roof when you already have solar. Uh, yep, yeah, again, so it, there are companies who will remove and replace the system. If you need to redo the roof, it'll typically cost a couple hundred per panel. Unfortunately, not a resource that we are able to provide at Energy Sage. Ours is specifically for buying new systems rather than maintenance, maintenance on existing systems. But if you're able to find a local solar contractor, they will typically have rates for removal and replacement of an existing system. Um, uh, moving on here, uh, property tax, uh, there was a property tax question. Most states have property tax exemptions for solar, so it would not have any impact on the property tax. Um, uh, question on pursuing more solar if your electric bill is already pretty low. $20 a month, honestly, would it be a small enough system expansion that I'd say it's probably not worth it if you're only adding a few extra panels, unless you're looking to go beyond that, again, to prepare uh, for future increased usage. Certainly, that's something you could look into. If not, though, you could, again, always look into community solar as a, as an add-on to your existing rooftop system. In, in most places, those are not uh, mutually exclusive. You could do both. That actually, I'll, I'll add an extension to that. That extends to stuff like uh, community choice electricity as well. Community solar does not actually change your energy supplier. You're still going through your grid-supplied energy. You're just using community solar to offset your electric bill. So you could, in some cases, go with a clean energy-sourced electricity supplier for your home. And then supplement that with community solar to offset your bill. So kind of being able to double dip there a little bit uh, is possible in most areas. Um, scanning through here, what determines the size of the array? Uh, this, again, was going to come down to installer sizing for your long-term usage. So either current usage or future usage, they'll ideally try to target that as best as possible within the restriction provided by the utility company. So utilities will, some, in some cases, not allow you to go above a certain mark, but installers will be able to help maximize that to the best they, of their ability. And your installer is going to have a good understanding of that. Um, what is the average payback for solar panels? This depends entirely on your area. I would say places like Massachusetts and Rhode Island are typically about six to seven years. Something like New Hampshire might be a bit longer, but it's it really mostly determined by your cost of electricity. Uh, when searching for community solar, are you limited to systems in the same electric grid zone? Typically, yes, it'll be required that it's with a farm within your similar service territory. Um, but the, your what your defined service territory can differ a lot depending on your utility company. Um, so as, as an example, uh, I, I live in the Eversource region. I live in Somerville in Massachusetts. I live in, in, in Eversource service territory, and I'm able to work with a a uh, community solar farm that's actually based over by the Cape. So it can sometimes be pretty far, even if it's within the same kind of utility territory. Uh, did okay. you say you can take 30% for the standalone battery? The battery no longer needs to be paired with solar to be eligible for the 30% credit. So as of this year, there is a standalone battery credit if you're only doing batteries as opposed to batteries plus solar. There's a question about what what how solar work when there's a loss of grid power oh yeah this that, this is a great question probably something uh we, we should have covered during during the slides there so apologies on my end for that so solar without batteries is going to disconnect when you lose power to the grid solar on its own unfortunately cannot serve as a viable backup solution as you're you're you, with for utility workers working on the lines it becomes a safety hazard to have a live system outputting power that would still need to be able to offset power back into the grid with battery storage installed you can store energy in the batteries during the day 
draw from the batteries during an outage or at night, and then during the day, use panels to refuel the batteries. So with batteries would be required if you want to be able to operate during an outage. But that's, again, why a large reason of why batteries for some homes can make a lot of sense. Someone also asked about the a phase out of the Massachusetts SMART program. So uh, if I had mentioned SMART earlier, where you get a certain incentive that pays you for the net metering and renewable energy credits in a lump sum as a credit on your electric bill. But yes, it is a program with a phase out. So as time goes by, the incentive shrinks. So, um, you know, if you get in with this round of smart, you might get a certain price, but if in, in the future, it's going to, that price is going to decrease. So what you get back decreases. And the reason they set it up that way is because uh, it's it's a state incentive program designed to help people install solar and, and make the market viable so that solar gets less expensive over time. But what we see often with these kinds of incentives is they renew them, extend them, or figure out a new one once you get to the get to the end. So we'll see what happens with SMART. Um, it's 101. Matt, is there anything else that's jumping out to you that you really want to answer before we close out? Yeah, yeah. So um, I would say this was a pretty good overall coverage of at least some of the quicker questions we were able to get through. Again, for anyone with more detailed questions, absolutely recommend setting up an account with Energy Sage first, and then we can absolutely set more time aside for to be able to talk through your, your more detailed questions or individual situation more in depth. Um, uh, so otherwise, the, the, I hope this was a, a helpful starting point for for anyone joining. Thanks, thanks everyone for taking time out of your out of your day to join today. Yes, thank you so much. We really appreciate you all coming, and um, we apologize we didn't get to all the questions. So again, you'll you'll hear from us, and you can follow up and, and get an appointment, and talk through your your solar project with Matt and his team. And uh, again, we appreciate you coming. If you want to come to more events like this, please hit up greenenergyconsumers.org slash events. If you love what we're doing here, please donate at greenenergyconsumers.org slash donate. And thank you, Matt. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful well, day. Everyone has a great day.